uh, systemic circulation or in the pulmonary circulation. Uh, the last one is an acute decompensation heart failure, meaning some patient has got, had severe heart failure or acute heart failure in the past, but with the proper management, the patient has revert back to a stable phase. So this is called, called acute decompensated heart failure. Uh, 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 they can, once they are decompensated, deteriorate. If they can be revived, they can go for a chronic phase or another phase. So these are clinical uh, aspects to, uh, to just clinically stays the patients. Now, uh, with this background, these are a bit older background. Now, with this background, there are some recent categorization of heart failure. And this categorization has been done by considering the ejection fraction of the heart. And we know that the ejection fraction of the heart is one of the major for systolic function of the heart ejection fraction. So considering the ejection fraction and considering the different stages of developing heart failure, uh, the heart failure has now been classified as first is a heart failure with irreduction ejection fraction. And conventionally, this rejection fraction, the rejection fraction has been termed as when the patient has his ejection or heart ejection fraction less than 45, 40%. With, and if they have got heart failure symptom, these patients are uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. On the other side of the uh, scale is a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, where the ejection fraction is 12 or more than 50%. So these are the two end of the uh, of the spectrum of dividing heart failure. But what about in the middle? Uh, heart failure with uh, uh, ejection fraction of 40% to 49%, what will be that? This is again categorized as a mid-range ejection, heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction. So in the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, we know much of it. Uh, we more slight of heart failure with ejection fraction and the knowledge regarding uh, uh, knowledge uh, regarding uh, mid range heart ejection fraction it is still very poor it's still very poor so <clears throat> now if we can see the proportion of the patients the ejection fraction of uh, uh, heart failure with uh, reduced ejection fraction around uh, 40% of the patients uh, ejection fraction, and they are constitute around 50% heart failure patient. And heart failure, true heart failure patient with preserved ejection fraction is around 36. And uh, mid-range uh, is calculated as to be 41%. And one, we can see the patient with left ventricular ejection fraction in the range of 40 to 49, depending on gray area, basically. And this has been termed as heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction. And this is the, the, the diagnostic criteria as has been described by the ESC. So all type of heart failure needs symptoms plus signs and their respect, respective range of ejection fraction. For example, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction has signs and symptoms plus less than 40% ejection fraction. Heart failure with uh, Preserved ejection fraction, that was symptoms and signs plus ejection fraction more than 50%, and the mid range between 40%. In addition, the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and heart failure with mid range ejection fraction has certain, uh, certain characteristics. For example, they should have elevated levels of natriuretic wave lights. At least one in additional criteria is relevant structural heart disease, say, for example, left ventricular hypertrophy or left ventricular enlargement or diastolic dysfunction. So this is the practical or working diagnostic definition of the three group of uh, heart failure. So before we start uh, actual pathophysiology of the, of, uh, the heart failure with the ejection fraction, uh, let's see something of the cardiac cycle and the physiology of the diastole. And uh, this is very, very basic from physiology knowledge we can have the two alternative phases of the cardiac cycle. On the right side of the figure, you see the systolic phase, which contains of isolated volumetric contraction injection phase. And the more important for us at the moment is the diastole, which has got, in fact, four uh, <clears throat> phases. One is isovolumetric relaxation phase, and the rapid filling phase, and another phase is diastasis and atrial contraction. Out of these four phases, 
uh, the last three phases, it means rapid filling, diastasis, and atrial contraction. In these three periods, actually, bloods can move from atria to ventricle. And <clears throat> the main importance of uh, uh, this diastolic function is the diastolic dysfunctions. And that is very important because left ventricular relaxation is important. And who's, if it's impaired, then maybe possibly diastolic function will be impaired. So if diastolic function is impaired, then there will be increased pressure and there will be increased pressure. pressure. In, the, uh, in the figure, you can see about 70 to 80 percent of the uh, patient uh, of the period is uh, for early, uh, early uh, feeling period. And you can see a lot of uh, uh, factors which govern this one. For example, ALA really pressure, myocardial relaxation, and so many. There's systolic function, LA pressure, LA stiffness, LV stiffness, and sometimes uh, uh, functional limit of the valve. And few others are atrial systole is uh, contributing to 15 to 20%, and the 5% is diastasis. So mostly, if, if you can see that when some patient develop diastolic dysfunction, many of the factors, they uh, come into play and reduce the early repeat, uh, uh, period as a whole. And uh, if we see that, though, so the term is left, uh, left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. And this main important fundamental mechanisms are the slowing of relaxation as stored earlier, and then less storing of the force and increase the stiffness of, this, uh, of the left ventricle. If you see in the right hand figure on the right side, the upper part is from the mechanical window where you can have good LV relaxation. The storing of the force, these are normal values, and lengthening of the load. These three component of feeling will affect if there is dysfunction. So possible mechanisms are the structural heart disease like hypertrophy and say constriction or fibrosis, and functional is usually ischemic and other. So, so when these factors are came into play, so diastolic dysfunction may appear. Now, this can be uh, explained in a very, uh, very easier way by a balloon and a football analogy. Uh, we can see the normal heart with normal uh, elasticity, relaxation, everything. And we can compare this heart uh, with a balloon. And this balloon is very small. And this can be very compliant rubber balloon. And we can easily uh, uh, fill this balloon in the mouth uh, with, uh, with the force from the mouth. But if you consider, the patients with a stiff heart or say hypertensive heart or otherwise, where heart is very stiff. And this can be, con uh, can be compared with the football. And in football, we cannot, we cannot inflate the football with our mouth pressure. And many a times it needs an extra pump to be needed. So the upper part, the balloon part is the normal phenomenon. And the lower part, the football part is the phenomena where diastolic stiffening is more high, the relaxation is lower, and uh, dysfunction is there. So now it comes to the proper uh, uh, heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction, uh, starting with the definition of some of the epidemiology. Uh, in general of cardiology, this is a 20, 2017 definition. Just this is a working definition. The heart failure with preserved ejection represents basically a heterogeneous collection of conditions. This is not a single condition like other disease. And these conditions are unified. For example, they must have an ejection fraction of more than 50%. There will be an evidence of impaired diastolic function and possibly some uh, elevated natural peptide levels. And all of this will be in the typical consist of heart failure signs and symptoms. And this is particularly is a large unmet clinical condition in cardiology throughout the lecture. So in the beginning, that I've got a subtitle that this particular heart failure is a growing global uh, epidemic at the moment for the cardiologist. And there are certain risk factors, you know, there might be some structural functional cardiac abnormalities will be there, and they actually result in reduced cardiac, uh, cardiac output and in the cardiac pressure will be increased either at rest or, or uh, during space. Basically, these pa pa patients are older, older people with diabetes, high BMI, smoking, atrial fibrillation are predictors. And the patients with, uh, who have got history of hypertension, atrial fibrillation, CKD, 
uh, also likely to develop uh, this particular disease more quickly. Uh, epidemiologically, if you see that uh, approximately the patient older than 65, they represent over 50 percent of the prevalent heart, heart failure patient in the community. Uh, and the highest decile means those patients who are age is more than 90 percent. Almost everybody, almost everybody uh, will be living with heart failure with a, a rejection fraction. And definitely, uh, this uh, uh, heart failure with rejection is associated with. Uh, high mortality and morbidity due to their age, poor morbid conditions, and the heart failure symptoms. Uh, about a five-year survival is around 35%, worse than many cancers possibly, and the risk of death for heart failure increase with the increasing of poor morbidity burden. It's a poor morbidity burden, say diabetes, hypertension, and other diseases. Patients with uh, uh, this disease are similarly high rehospitalization rate as with the heart failure patient with a reduced ejection fraction. And patient is hospitalized and the discharge, 20% are readmitted within 30 days. And uh, more than 50% will readmit in the one year. So this is morbidity and mortality figure uh, shows the tremendous load of this particular duty to the healthcare services delivery system of any country. Now, uh, there's a two example. Uh, this example shows in the bias, right? This is uh, due to a heart failure with reduced exemption. For last three decades, you can see the graph, the, uh, the survival rate has improved, not very large, but definitely there is significant improvement by management, medications, and other. Uh, from 1987 to 2001, uh, the uh, survival rate is in, improved. But look on the right side, the patients with heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction, from the same period, the if survival rate is not significantly improved. Uh, now, the, how this patient die basically, mode of death, the, actually the cause specific mortality between these two groups is the data is highly variable. That there are differences between the data from RCTs and also from the register. But it's a common thing, important thing is that the non-cardiovascular death is significantly higher, for example, around 50% than uh, for the heart failure with the reduced ejection fraction, which is about 36%. Possibly this reflects that this particular patients have uh, more poor morbidity condition, aged people, possibly they may have got other cause of death than cardiovascular diseases. Now, so look so something about the pathophysiology of uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Uh, pathology G actually varies with a wide variety of phenotypes. This is not a single uh, patient like diabetes, like hypertension, like rheumatic heart disease, not even like ischemic heart disease. This particular group has a wide variety of phenotypes resulting from different aspects of pathophysiological mechanism, comorbidities, dominant clinical characters, and that all these things make diagnosis and treatment extremely challenging. Patients with heart failure are generally older, as you have told earlier, predominantly women, and have got multiple comorbidities like hypertension, obesity, CAD, uh, uh, anemia, atrial fibrillation, diabetes, renal inspection, and sometimes patients may have got all sleep apnea. And these, all these basically comorbidities affect ventricular and vascular remodeling, which are essential for the development of uh, heart failure with ejection, uh, with ejection fraction. So the basic mechanism actually, what this particular thing do, they changes in left ventricular relaxation and feeling. They increase the left ventricular and reptile structure remodeling. And also they alter their geometry, increasing the stiffness and decreasing in cardiac compliance. The changes in the left ventricular and systemic and pulmonary vascular compliance, skeletal muscles and endothelial change also been changed. and there are pro-inflammatory and pro-fibrotic signaling increases in these particular cases. So ultimately, they increase the left feeling pressure. I would atrial pulmonary right ventricular levels. They also include the upstream pathology in the right heart system. So <clears throat> uh, what about the LV diastolic dysfunction in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Definitely the most common cause of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is left ventricular dysfunction, secondary to the stiffness, hypertrophied heart. But we must remember, it is not the sole pathophysiological driver 
for this type of heart failure. It is important not to equate left ventricular systole dysfunction with left ventricular uh, heart failure with uh, pressure ejection fraction because many of the patient, older patient, are in, and essentially normal general population paper, we may detect left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. So, but the left ventricular diastolic dysfunction is caused by microtial structural changes, microvascular dysfunction, uh, uh, dysfunction, systemic inflammation, and some sort of increased passive uh, uh, stiffness of the chambers. Now, uh, now we see two aspects of this uh, function, left ventricular and diastolic volume and left ventricular feeling pressure in heart failure with PGF ejection fraction during uh, exercise and rest. On this left hand figure you see, uh, we compare two patients, normal patients and with uh, patient. Uh, normal patient you see in the pink and the abnormal patient, uh, uh, patient heart failure with PGF ejection fraction in red. In the rest period, you can see they are more or less in the similar industri industrial volume and in systolic volume. But after exercise, the normal patients uh, increases the uh, preload reserve and also the ionotic vascular reserve also increase comparing to the patients with left, uh, heart failure with PGF ejection fraction where there is impaired stroke volume reserve. So they have got reduced changes in this. So this may be a very earlier situation where only diagnostic change can be by uh, diagnostic uh, tests. On the right side, you can see, what about the pressure, semi? For example, in this figure, during rest, you see the pressure of two pressure, one left atrial pressure and left ventricular pressure. Uh, in the rest, you see the pressure curve in the lower pressure curve of the left atrium. When after exercise, you see the tremendous increase of the left atrial pressure. So in during rest, this patient, particular patient may not have any symptom, but after exercise or during exercise, their left atrial pressure will increase and thereby they can give right to symptom. So sometimes the, these type of patient have symptoms in exercise and, or their exercise capacity is lowered, but they are asymptomatic in, uh, when they are in rest. Uh, so this is uh, left ventricular reserve. Sometimes the ejection fraction is normal or near normal, but the systolic function sometimes are found in normal. So this is not only diastolic dysfunction, but though not very common, many of the patients of this uh, group may have got some sort of systolic dysfunction, may not have overt failure, but systolic. we call them subtool, sub uh, subtle late ventricular uh, systolic dysfunction because this is a millimanon. For example, uh, <coughs> we'll come to later. So now see what about the chronology of development of heart failure with PGF ejection fraction. I've told earlier that uh, the comorbid in the left hand side, most of the comorbidity is present here, like for example, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and some sort of renal dysfunction. And they can include the chronic systemic infl inflammation uh, the marker may be CRP, may be uh, interleukin and others. And when this attack the multi-organ, they have different aspects. For example, in the part of lung, if they can develop pulmonary function, they have got a skeletal muscle, they may have got sodium retention in the, uh, in, the sodium, in, the, in the kidney. So when they Im improve, involve the multi-organ, there are certain endothelial cardiomyocytes signaling system, which is very common, I'm going to detail. And ultimately different, within different signaling system inside the endothelium and myocytes, they go for fibroblasts, they affect the fibroblasts, microbes are giving collagen, and ultimately they develop hypertrophy and stiffness. If you go more detail in this particular uh, picture, uh, with the comorbidity on the left-hand side, the patient, the loss actually, there will be some systemic in, uh, inflammation. And in systemic inflammation, the, the like high, uh, high, high sensitivity, CRP, and other uh, marker will, will, will increase. And when they go for endothelial cell, they get the primary injury to the microvessels. And microvessel inflammation and endothelial activation causes this endothelial <coughs> mesenchymal transition in the my myocytes. So this cardiomyocytes with a secondary cardiomyocyte injury and they also develop some sort of vascular, coronary vascular uh, involvement where nitric oxide is decreased. Uh, there is, they, they loss or they reduce the vasodilatory properties and ultimately they got 
they develop, say, vasoconstriction, which may give rise to stiffness of the lip ventricle and collagenization. And ultimately, with these mediators, the phenotype, different phenotype of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction has developed. So this is how starting for comorbidities or without any disease, through organ involvement, through molecular system, they develop a heart failure function. Again, they come as a morphological macroscopic changes. Uh, if we now con consider this, this particular uh, heart failure in the general, uh, general uh, categorization, get general heart failure. Say here on the left side, you see, if you compare this as a stage of stage A of heart failure, here again, we may have what, uh, what uh, type of things we can get, particularly to this patient. We'll have risk factors for development of preclinical diastolic dysfunction. Remember, this is very important. Preclinical diastolic dysfunction is very important. Possibly this is a great signal for the physician to prevent the disease. If we lose it, maybe some of the patient will go for heart failure. So through this, there are certain uh, uh, comorbidities or risk factors that I said before, and I already have told you earlier, maybe uh, acute coronary syndrome, AIDS, hyperlipidemia, uh, metabolic syndrome, so on. So once they progress to the stage B heart failure, so they develop preclinical diastolic dysfunction. And here again, we can have, if they, they join with these cardiovascular risk factors, non-cardiac risk factors also contribute here. For example, renal dysfunction, anemia, and COPD. So if they go farther, they can enter in the stage C or D, which is practically heart failure, and they develop actually heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And though this is uh, has been shown, so the development of uh, uh, diastolic dysfunction of this uh, stage B, uh, the duration possibly is not uh, well understood, but once they develop symptom, the mortality probably includes a five-year mortality is quite significant. So this is how uh, we must think of the development of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So what about the clinical man manifestation and assessment very quickly? Uh, I'm not going to detail in this thing because I summarize this thing. Say, for example, symptom as I told earlier, they may have exertional dyspnea, fatigue in the most of the cases. Comorbid condition I've already said, most common comorbidity 80% in, in uh, hypertension, obesity is around 50%, metabolic syndrome, diabetes around 30 to 40%. Important, another important comorbidity is coronary artery disease 50 to 60%. Look at here, all the comorbidities are very important and most of them can be controlled. Most of their progress can be, uh, uh, can be slowed down. So here, here is the uh, position where the doctors can do many things. In examination, we know that the heart failure symptom, we can have a, a, a jugular venous distension, edema, et cetera. Chest angiography does not markedly show anything, but in a symptomatic case, it may have some, uh, some uh, lung finding like pulmonary edema. Uh, plasma M level in many cases is open normal, but there may be some slightly upper value, and upper value has been described. And echocardiography, I will, uh, I will discuss it later. There are certain echocardiography para, uh, para, uh, <clears throat> parameters. Most of them are parameters for diastolic dysfunction. And in some cases, we may need uh, invasive uh, hemodynamics where we can, uh, uh, we can assess the pulmonary artery wage pressure. Uh, either in rest and exercise. During exercise, most of the pressure can rise, I have shown earlier. And uh, <clears throat> you can see the uh, difference between the heart failure with, uh, with ejection fraction and with uh, the reduced ejection fraction. Uh, this is very simple, as you already discussed here. Uh, important thing is uh, in reduced is a male is uh, more, um, more, more. And the fem uh, preserved ejection when the female is uh, more predominant, uh, most in the older patient. LB size uh, is almost normal cavity size uh, in compared to dilated in, uh, in a reduced ejection fraction. And a systolic function is obviously in the reduced ejection depressed. Here is mildly depressed or normal. And uh, a diastolic dysfunction is uh, both the cases, it may be uh, impaired. And primary hypertension is common in both the side. And BNP levels uh, is normal sometimes, here, yeah, yeah, lower or normal. And exercise capacity is severely impaired in both the cases. So important aspect of the therapy here, I'll discuss later, that there is a modest 
BP <clears throat> effect on vasodilators, but there are marked BP reduction in vasodilators. So no evidence of medical treatment. So next, how to assess? We must assess the patient regarding his cardiovascular structure and function. So for simplicity, I have divided into three parts. One is cardiovascular structure. Of the cardiovascular is structure, we must identify what is the LV volume. LV volume in most of the cases of physiological function, chamber dimensions is normal. Uh, and this can be assessed by uh, imaging technology, echocardiography, CMR, or CRR. Up to 5% of the patient have mild or increased LV volume. Uh, LV volume, the no upper limit, uh, upper limit of normal is 75 milliliter meter square. A LV volume less than 75% is one of the guideline based diagnostic criteria for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So, apart from the volume, we, must, we can uh, uh, assess the LV mass. LV mass is increased, and, this, uh, and the criteria is about 30 to 50% of the patient will have uh, increased mass. When it's present, LV is associated with significant ward prognosis. If the left ventricular hypertrophy increases or mild to severe, the prognosis is poor. The third part of the structure is the geometry. The geometry is very important. We know that this is done by the relative wall thickness. Either it is a concentric hypertrophy or it is an eccentric hypertrophy. Concentric remodeling can occur even in the absence of frank electrical hypertrophy in approximately 20 to 30% cases a patient's heart failure. And associated with 25 to 35% higher risk of heart failure, heart failure patient. But, so the translation is, if the patient has got a hyper, a, a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and at the same time, they have got also left ventricular hypertrophy, their uh, prognosis is poor and their mortality rate is pretty high. The second aspect is the, uh, is the function, cardiovascular function. The first is diastolic function. And the diastolic function is very important here because uh, this includes delay and slow relaxation, decreased recoil, slow and decreased distensibility. So all these parameters are related to the diastolic function of the lead ventricle. An important aspect is comprehensive echo assessment is very uh, useful in these particular cases uh, of, uh, of assessment. And diastolic function can be graded as per grade zero to grade three as per the echocardiography guidelines. And the two B is as a systolic function. I told earlier that apparently though ejection fraction is normal by two dimensional other maturity, there are certain subtle systolic dysfunction on this particular patient, patients of patients. So these particular patients, they have got, they may have got certain global LV systolic dysfunction to some extent, I'll see, show you later. So this is number one. Then what are the echocardiography assessment? As, as, as I showed earlier, that systolic and diastolic structure and function the, uh, assessment mainly depend on the echocardiographic assessment. So objective demonstration of underlying cardiac structural and functional abnormalities of the heart are necessary to establish the, uh, the diagnosis of epigenetic ejection fraction. And this can be done by comprehensive uh, echocardiography with Doppler TDI and speckle tracking is available. So we can have a comprehensive one. For example, this is the picture. You can see the, all the aspects of the development. From the lower left, you can see the tricuspid uh, annual systolic function. You can see the tissue doctor. You can see the pulmonary pressure by TRJ. Uh, on the right side, we can have got uh, a tissue doppler where mitral flow or lipratial strain can also be uh, arranged. And we can have got sort, some sort of longitudinal strain. Even we can uh, assess also the uh, uh, radial strain and also circumferential strain. So by this comprehensive assessment, echocardiogram assessment, we can categorize the cardiac function of the heart in this particular patient. This is an example of a heart failure, uh, heart failure patient with preserved ejection fraction. He has got normal ejection fraction, no symptom at the moment, but when the GLS is performed, you can see the reduction of GLS level in this particular patient. So this is a simple uh, diagram to just to make you understand. Uh, there are three aspects. On the left side, red is lead ventricular dysfunction. Uh, you can measure it by E prime. Uh, 
and that can also be all be stain imaging by ejection uh, or the wet uh, ejection and on the right side leg ventricular artery early liquid recoil can also be uh, measured by or categorized by e prime and also by left ventricular untwisting but the important aspect in the middle is left ventricular stiffness uh, we can go for <clears throat> uh, dt but transit time and all these can categorize or can assess qualitatively and quantitatively left ventricular feeling pressure and the parameter in the lower down if possible all the parameter of the post lower down can be assessed by a comprehensive echocardiographic examination how uh, which can uh, categorize this particular patient's is prognosis and possibly in future mode of therapy and this is a very simple uh, everybody of you know this is how the diastolic pressure can be uh, graded here graded here one in, important aspect i want to mention that the mitral flow and the mitral flow uh, after peak valsalva you can see over here the diagnostic criteria once you started the grade of one then grade 1 2 3 2 1 2 3 can go from either side to one flow the grade c may improve on the right side and then their interpretation will be different so the main idea is try to uh, try to assess as many parameters as possible and for mitral inflow we must perform the peak valsalva effect on the person uh very to make it very simple uh to integrate eco evaluation if now the top box if the left ventricular <clears throat> uh left atrial volume index is less than 35 uh e prime less than 8 e lateral 10 so possibly this is there is no diastolic dysfunction so this is a very simple aspect but if the left atrial volume index is more than 34 uh e septal is more, uh, less than 8 lateral less than 8 possibly they have got diastolic dysfunction very simple to understand not to go in detail like the previous one once you see the diastolic dysfunction then go for the categorization grade 1 2 3 and there are simple numbers numbers of this particular so if you can see over here there are only four or five parameters if you know that and if you know their value then possibly you can a uh, diagnose whether the patient has got a, a diastolic dysfunction or not or if they have got diastolic dysfunction what are the uh, uh, category they are belong so now let on the and the end possible the diagnosis and management so heart failure uh, uh, there is no this is a challenging syndrome so there is no simple imaging test or any biomarker test we can conclusively diagnose this particular thing but in many cases this is the there is a step wise approach utilizing careful physical history examination peptides and others if you go step wise possibly we can categorize or diagnose this particular patient so now there are two important definition the current definition from one from uh, 2013 ACCH guideline on the right side you see the both are common signs and symptoms of heart failure and the ejection factor is more than 50 and they do not mention about the bnp level but they also may, they mentioned abnormal lv diastolic dysfunction the more elaborate definition was 2016 esc the first two criteria are the same they added uh, nativity peptide and they give their uh, value but cut of values and the imaging value they have also given like relevant structural heart disease is there there either there is lv or left atrial uh, enlargement and there are some major shop left ventricular diastolic dysfunction which i have already discussed earlier so the very new guideline uh, very recently in the 2009 they proposed they call it heart failure association pff algorithm here uh, almost a similar but a bit elaborate uh, is if anybody has got proper uh, interest or if anybody want to have some sort of Uh, research activities in this way possibly for these for these uh, this uh, algorithm is important but for general uh, cardiologists like me uh, it's not that much important at the moment to treating general patient so the first is p what is called is initial workup and what do you call it p test assessment so here we can see some of the symptoms some echo some ecg uh, findings the general finding and the second stage we call diagnostic workup and the name is main important thing here is two important thing is echocardiography and natriuretic peptide so with these two particular modalities 
they make a score. I will discuss it a bit later. Uh, so for that reason, we must have a comprehensive echo examination and we have got a very, uh, very careful network equipment evaluation. The next two, basically F1 and F2, there are two F. The first F1 is advanced workup. We call it functional testing in case of uncertainty. If these two steps cannot give any certain diagnosis, then we can go for the third step here. In here, we can have some sort of diastole test testing like exercise echocardiography and if needed for invasive measurements. And if, if you want to know that pinpoint the etiology, then you can go for etiological work, uh, workup that is called final etiology. So this is two phase functional and final. So in here also a CMR, uh, scintigraphy and all other things. So from starting from very simple to very advanced uh, can be given. So as we showed earlier that with two aspects of that uh, that's the algorithm, echo and aortic peptide, we have got some morphological and functional and biomarker classification, and they made some sort of scoring system. They call it echo natriotic peptide score. So you see on the left hand side, major and minor, and the other side is a functional morphological biomarker in sinus rhythm, biomarker level in atrial rhythm. So you can see like that, and there are certain, uh, uh, certain uh, marker uh, values are there when you consider uh, major, when you consider minor. I am not going to detail uh, the, uh, uh, the reference has given in the, uh, in the bottom, you can study it. So with this particular point, they give some point system in the, in the lower, lower part of the, of the slide. You see their major criteria, if they have a two points, got it. And in the, if we agree, the total these uh, tri major criteria and for minor criteria for one. So if you add, add major and minor criteria points, if it is more than five or more, then it is definite diagnosis of heart failure with visual rejection fraction. And if it is two to four, maybe some other test is needed to diagnose. So now, <clears throat> a very simple way how to uh, diagnose the patient and to treat the patient. A simple way is to uh, step. There are six steps of the patient. First is uh, ask the question, are there symptoms of heart failure or not? Uh, and what is the LV rejection fraction, this next part? And what is the age of the patient and possible risk factors is there or not? And uh, what is the BN24 BNP level for diagnosis? And what the detailed review of the comprehensive echo? So you can see over here, of the, this stage, most of the patient can be categorized. And the last stage is, are confirmatory tests needed? If you want, then we can go for uh, right heart catheterization or cardiopulmonary exercise testing. So with this, uh, I'm not going to detail. This particular figure is from the uh, from uh, brown wall, I think, uh, you can get. So on the first A, B, C, you see the similar, uh, what I was said, there is some clinical evidences of heart failure, supportive lab, then ejection fraction, mostly by echo, and antecedent or comorbid disease is there or not, you have to exclude it. So this four picture that the basic assessment of the diagnostic workup for the patient. And the next is the morphological and major I have already uh, shown in the earlier slide. If, and then if needed, then you can go for rest and exercise test. So these are the state you follow. So if you follow this particular algorithm, possibly you will understand everything of the heart failure with preserved rejection fraction. Then come to therapy. Actually, there is no disease modifying agents available till now for this, and no specific therapy has yet proven to reduce mortality and morbidity. So therefore, treatment guidelines focused on diuretic therapy for congestion, treatment for hypertension, diagnosis and treatment for ischemia, rate control for atrial fibrillation, and of course, treatment for all other comorbidities. So these are the RCTs till now, but not given very significant effect of the treatment, you can see. Very few. You see in the middle channel, that we, uh, in heart failure with preservation uh, fraction, most of the treatment facilities, either medication or, or uh, a device, uh, does not have given that much of important as is given in heart disease fraction. And the right side, you can see the study which has been there. So the management aspect is basically three aspects, I want to say. The one is the reduction and prevention of pulmonary and peripheral venous congestion by fluid and uh, sodium reduction. Judicious usage of diuretics and natrics should be given for uh, proper uh, symptom relief. 
and appropriate remote monitoring based tailored care should be there. This is very important because this patient does not come to you before they have got severe symptoms. So a sort of remote monitoring or outpatient monitoring is very important. The next aspect is the aggressive treatment of antecedent and comorbid condition. So control BP at rest and modify the doses, control the glucose, treat and prevent the ischemia. This is very important. Maintain the adequate renal function and treat obesity of either by medical or if possible surgical uh, uh, weight loss management system. And the last is optimize the cardiac functional status. The patient must have got, uh, uh, must have got their st clinical status stable. So that for that, we must prevent excessive tachycardia or bradycardia. Uh, their metabolic needs should be given by the heart rate as they are to maintain and restore the normal sinus rhythm if possible. And the control ventricular storm in case of bacterial arrhythmia, in, uh, arrhythmia the ventricular rate uh, should be under control. So this is another one I'm going to detail. So you can, you can classify your patient according to what? What is, what is the symptom on the upper side? For example, lung congestion, chromot congestion, pulmonary hypertension, skeletal muscle active fibrillation. And you can, uh, you can classify another group uh, on the left-hand side by the overweight, uh, missed comorbidity. And for that reason, there are different, different drugs which may have got certain uh, uh, a certain effect. So that has been given in a recent publication that uh, you can use, you can try that use. Uh, possibly say at the last, actually, I want to show you the, the importance of coronary artery disease because these are the elderly people with a lot of coronary risk factors. This patient uh, has got coronary artery disease. So this is a study where the a compared to <clears throat> compared to heart failure, with major ejection fraction patient with no coronary artery disease and with coronary arteries, they dis, uh, display the increased mortality. You see here on the right side, and the red is heart failure with uh, without coronary disease and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So those who have got uh, heart failure and those do not have, you see the difference. And another one, if we detect a patient significant coronary disease, we must revascularize it. You can see the effect of revascularization here. If you revascularize with coronary disease, uh, their prognosis is better than those who do not have. So in the point where uh, coronary artery disease is significant, on, they must be evaluated if there is a significant symptom for the possibility of revascularization. And if revascularization is indicated, they must be revascularized. So this is at the end of my presentation here. The, what are the current treatment? But very key points. So first is symptomatic treatment with diuretics, treatment of hypertension, maybe diuretic inhibitor MRAs, treatment of ischemia uh, uh, should be there and symptoms should be relieved. Anticoagulant perpetuation, the atrial fibrillation, rate control of the atrial fibrillation. We, still, we do not know what is the uh, optimal rate for this. Uh, and spinal electron for reduction of heart failure, rehospitalization, possibly more effective in uh, preservation of patient with body ejection fraction. So if we remember at least the last one, then we can possibly have this uh, happening there. So uh, with uh, this uh, presentation, with this uh, simple uh, discussion, I like to uh, stop my presentation here and waiting for the discussion. Uh, thank you very much for all the, uh, all the residents, all the fellows in training, and all the uh, 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 students are in the course. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. You, as you said, brilliant, sir. Brilliant presentation. <laughs> yeah. And tell us your presentation, sir. Sir, uh, you had the yes. great accommodation and click a list to carry over. But, sir, I always said my fellows that you should like young, energetic, and smart like Professor Nadu, sir. Uh, you always uh, young and smart presentation, always, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay. I'd like to uh, sign on to Mr. Nuzu, sir. Oh, sir, skin shatter on the go, sir. Uh, uh, uh. Skin shatter on the go, sir. Skin shatter, na? Skin shatter, na? Skin shatter, na? Skin as I was telling about the elaborate presentation, yeah. so elaborate. <laughs> as I was telling, <laughs> the heart failure with preserved expression is actually <laughs> as an enigma. 
particularly from the point of view of treatment, which drug, how much should we use it, should we not? For example, Sarva was saying, in atrial fibrillation, the rate control, we do not know because previously we thought the rate should be around 70 to 80, but recent studies have shown the rate could be as high as 110, between 90 to 110, and that will not have any effect on the uh, mortality. So even in atrial fibrillation, we are not sure whether the rate control, controlling the rate, keeping it around 70 to 80 is beneficial or not. There are many questions than answers regarding the treatment aspect. I think uh, Abdul Sar has joined. Khalid Musil Bhai is there, many other persons there. We'll be asking questions and we'll be taking questions from the students. And uh, we hope to learn uh, much more from Sir again. Sir, Khalid Mosin, sir, do you hear me? Yes. Khalid Mosin, sir. Uh, yes, Mosin. I, I, I am very much grateful to my teacher and mentor, Rajul, sir. As usual, he is uh, really is an expert in the, this field. Uh, actually, the I I have just comment. I don't have any questions. Uh, actually, the diagnosing the disease of uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is a really it's a big problem. It is for the two aspects because the patient presents us with the non-specific symptoms like fatigue. But one thing I personally feel that if we inquire uh, carefully, many of them has an history of paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Uh, this is a symptom uh, which we must uh, inquire the patient uh, very meticulously. This, this might give us a clue. And another thing, the echocardiographic examination is the main tool for diagnosing. But unfortunately, uh, the echocardiographers of our country, they are so much pressed for time that they cannot uh, give enough time to meticulously evaluate because it is a very difficult eco diagnosis. Uh, in uh, uh, Western world, the eco are done by the eco technologies. They are given half an hour, you uh, record everything, then you present to the uh, cardiologist. But in our country, the doctors have to do the eco with a very hard test of time and they cannot see all those parameters uh, which are necessary for diagnosis. So many of the uh, LV, uh, Sorry, many many of the heart failure with preserved rejection. I think they are, the diagnosis is missed. And regarding treatment, uh, I had a previous diagnosis that with the keeping the heart rate as low as possible uh, is probably good because the diastole. If we prolong the diastole, there might be uh, the improved compliance of the left ventricle. But uh, nowadays, as Vadud has said, that is this uh, uh, notion has been changed. So we must. Uh, emphasize for a thorough history taking and a very good meticulous eco examination for diagnosing uh, this group of patient. Treatment is, as Sar has said, there is no specific treatment apart from uh, uh, the endothelin antagonist, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, these are the two drugs, but we must uh, uh, be very careful to exclude the diagnosis. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, sir, sir I, can I ask you a question, sir? Mm -hmm. uh, if I want to do a very hurried echo, and which two or three parameters that can give me a clue the patient probably has diastolic dysfunction? Uh, basically, uh, uh, not only only the diastolic dysfunction. If you see only very few parameters, uh, uh, important is I will come to later. But before that, our echocardiographer most of the time we, we do not know about the patient. So clinical information, yeah. very important. What the clinician actually wants to know, if they know that the patient is may have diastolic dysfunction, that's heart failure, so they can go accordingly. Now coming to your point, actually basic diagnosis is for a structure, you can give left ventricle hypertrophy by simple by 2D echocardiography. Uh, and uh, later you can go for Doppler echocardiography, the flow rate, so mitral flow, and tissue development. If you do only these two, then possibly you can categorize 90% of the patient. But if we add with this a pulmonary flow, possibly you can add another 5%. So in the uh, last 5% you cannot do that. So my suggestion is for doing echocardiography, you do 2D echocardiography, systolic function, 
and structure, say heart failure or the eccentric or eccentric development of hypertrophy. So this is very simple. If you can do by two dimensional echocardiography. And for Doppler and tissue, tissue is very important, now, very simple nowadays. Just it, it, is a, uh, it is a time for a button to kick. So you can give either uh, tissue Doppler imaging, mostly lateral and medial, and mitral flow. And if you have enough time, then you can go for pulmonary vein. If you do all these three things, possibly, and if you practice it for a month or two, the total time for this examination should not take more than five to 10 minutes. Can I add something? Sometimes the people get, they raise pulmonary pressure with the preserve detection fraction. I think that's the point that patient actually have diastolic dysfunction. Yes. Then we should pay a little bit more attention to the, those diastolic parameters. Yes. Is it, sir? This is important. Uh, then another two things is important. There's this LA measurement can be easily done by 2D. So you can go yeah. have an LA measurement and LA, LA yeah. uh, volume. Uh, yes. Volume, and volume index all is very, all very all sensitive. Always for heart failure patient, uh, we can make a routine. One is two-dimensional for structural function, tissue Doppler, uh, and, and the uh, mitral flow and problem flow. And another two important is ALA measurement and IVC collapsibility. So these four or five things is very simple. Just A, B, C, D. Uh, you can make. This is very simple. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Rehan, uh, uh, sir, uh, Professor Jalal, sir, with us. Professor, okay. senior teacher, Professor uh, Jalaluddin, sir, with us. Professor Jalaluddin, sir. Please unmute, sir. Sir, sir Jalal, sir. Uh, sir, assalamu alaikum, sir. You have gifts to give some time to start to get adopted with this technology. Sir, you have to unmute Sir, you have to unmute Sir, Mr. Jalal, sir. Covid by which old man? Covid by Covid by Shura Chena. What is the the sound? Balakore Balaku. Sir, I need of the Covid. Covid কথা বোঝা যাচ্ছে হ্যাঁ বলো একটু আমার মনে হচ্ছে স্যার আমি 20 বছর আগে স্যার যখন ছাত্র ছিলাম তখন ওই সময়টা গেছিলাম আপনাকে দেখে তখন ভালো লাগলো স্যার সুস্থ আছি সুস্থ আছি হ্যাঁ ভালো পুরো কথা শোনা পুরো কথা শোনা যাচ্ছে না তুমি ভালো আছো তো Motion, Balo, please shun the Vachina de Covid Kota, Covid Monday. Doctor Ojoy, Doctor Ojoy, do you have any question to Sir Ojoy? Ojoy, unmute. Okay, Shunarache. Shunarache, Ojoy Shunarache. I have a question to Professor Dudusam, sir. I must congratulate him for his brilliant presentation. Sir, I have question what is the prevalence of pulmonary hypertension and rv dysfunction in hepatic patient and how will you manage them basically the basically uh, the clear cut uh, prevalence of pulmonary, uh, pulmonary hypertension and it is around five uh, in pulmonary patient those who are advanced middle moderate to severe uh, heart failure they have got around 30 to 35 percent pulmonary hypertension patients and most of them also have got their right ventricular dysfunction and right atrial dysfunction. So in some cases, in advanced studies, they also perform the right ventricular strain for that from very early beginning. Because once the left ventricular dysfunction prevails, it goes to fail the upstream right ventricular system. So once you develop a left ventricular dysfunction, those, those centers do follow the patient, they always uh, go for the uh, right ventricular function. 
they write the uh, the uh, measure or assess right ventricular uh, function by 2d examination doppler examination and also strain imaging so they do also both for strain for rv uh, or rv imaging so the Average incidence is around say 25 to 35 uh, pulmonary pressure in moderate to severe group. At the patient goes more severe, the pulmonary hypertension goes higher. Once they go to end stage, possibly pulmonary pain also goes down as the heart army fail, fail more more severely. Uh, basically, basically isolated. Uh, treatment for this particular hypertension not there. So you have seen in the my uh, in the chart that. Many of the patients are giving a PDE inhibitor for uh, this particular group, and uh, obviously, this the results is uh, uh, not that much with other finding. But this is uh, this is one of the experimental drug. The most of the patient uh, of, of the clinician do. Just let me mute that. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, can I add something? Yes, of course. Swam, sir. Uh, uh, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks for yes, a uh, wonderful and excellent lecture. Sir, I have a lot of heart failure to protect my affinity as one of the things that I have done. I have done a lot of work on this lecture. It is very easy to handle uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, uh, but it is very difficult to manage and diagnose heart failure with Preserved ejection function. The sir, a uh, wonderful lecture. John, one of the things I'm one of the things I'm the clear for the parla. The one question is that the what is the role of RNA in uh, the heart failure with pre pre preserved ejection function? Role of RNA in uh, heart failure with preserved ejection function. Thank you, sir. Uh, in fact, uh, we have got a separate study for with RNA preserved ejection function. So this is uh, the result is not tremendously encouraging, but uh, since uh, main drug ACE inhibitors and RA uh, RAS inhibitors as a whole, they have got certain beneficial role in the particular this patient. So in that way, RNA can give give some of the uh, improvement, symptomatic improvement for this particular patient. So, the study shows this Yeah, the study shows. Yes. Yeah. Would be See, uh, one thing is that uh, uh, we often actually equate LV diastole dysfunction with uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, but SAR has shown that both are not actually synonymous. And in the, if we become more, uh, give more importance to the heart failure with LV diastole, LV diastole dysfunction, the causative factors, Maybe we can prevent the occurrence of heart failure with preservation function. After its occurrence, there's very little actually we can uh, change the course of the disease. There's no drug that can actually change the mortality ratio. Uh, uh, I add, uh, 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 I'll just add two things. Uh, one is the heart failure continuum is very, very tricky uh, condition to treat. So that is why the we start staging Stage. so that we can start treatment from the beginning of the breath. So that staging has now been reconverted for the heart failure preserved. I showed, I have showed it data. So the, yeah. here, yeah. The, after the risk factor, the main important initial initial marker you can say rather you can marker is is a pre dysfunction. This is remote, no symptom. So. That is why very important for every patient, say female, obese, diabetic, hypertensive, and older than 60, must, we must routinely perform to echocardiograph examination, examination uh, how, what, what are the diastolic dysfunction. So if you have diastolic yeah. dysfunction, just, uh, just to locate him or mark him that this patient is going to have heart failure. Maybe it, it will start with a uh, uh, with ejection fraction if there is no structural damage. But if this patient develops structural damage, say for example coronary disease, their heart failure with reduction will be more worse. So with early diagnosis of late ventricular dysfunction, we can surrogate patients. We can surrogate patient or separate patient of the high risk. And if the patient at the same time also have got coronary disease, it is, is, is risk is more than 10 times. 
because he has got heart disease and go for that like so that is why the important thing is that diagnosis of the ventricular diagnosis can dictate the patient may develop uh, heart failure uh, heart failure ejection fraction uh, but may not also develop yeah. so this is very important what, what we have said that is that should be remembered for every physician to uh, patient with uh, who, which patient are dyspnea either in rest or with exercise or the pnt uh, pnt somebody has told the pnt uh, may have khaled uh, khaled was telling uh, many patient has got pnd so the, not only pnd many patient with sleep apnea they are also having yeah, say, yeah. dysfunction thank you thank you sir, sir oh, about one, about one pnt the... one thing is that the patients with copd or patient with heart failure both have exertion or shortness of breath yeah. but pnt is very specific for heart failure Really, PNT right. do not occur in COPD patient or respiratory patient. No. Sir, one question with the student, Dr. Rehan. Dr. Rehan, would you uh, ask a question? Dr. Rehan? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you ask sir. the question, please. Sir, uh, can we say alternatively a diastolic heart failure or heart failure with derivation fraction? My first question. And second question is that there is any intervention other than revascularization in Heart failure with the reduction. Thank you, sir. Basically, uh, the the term uh, diastolic heart failure and systolic heart failure was uh, previously uh, actually coined, say uh, around 40, 50 years ago. And this diastolic heart failure actually does not always mean that the patient has got the, the LV dysfunction or ejection fraction is lower. So initially, when the, uh, there was another term, forward flow and backward flow. And so systolic heart failure, failure and diastolic heart failure is very near to heart failure with pijab ejection fraction and reduced ejection, but not the same. So that is why the terminology has been changed. There are two terminology. One is staging, another is according to the ejection fraction. And to describe patient's clinical situation, you can use some term. So this is number one. Regarding intervention, intervention actually, the patient who has got uh, an associated comorbidity, say cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or adventricular dysfunction, or other, in that case, the patient may be assessed whether other device management can be there. Number two, if the patient is complicated with some sort of arrhythmias, the arrhythmias may be controlled with the antiarrhythmic drugs or antiarrhythmic devices. And the patient should be assessed for coronary disease, I have shown. If the patient develops coronary disease and symptom is coronary or the risk factor is pretty high, then we must, uh, we must uh, assess this uh, coronary circulation. And if this coronary circulatory system has got a significant disease, we can go for uh, revascularization, either surgery or other thing. So there is no definite, uh, definitive therapy for that. Once uh, the patient, if the patient progress from a ejection fraction to reduce ejection fraction to end discharge heart failure, possibly the end discharge heart failure device management will then be applied to these two operations also. Thank you, Atar sir. Atar Ali sir, do you Atar hear me? Atar Ali sir? Atar Ali sir? Uh, he is the right person to answer. Sir, sir. Atar Ali sir, do you hear me? Uh, most of the sir is not here now. Uh, just, just, uh, uh, I actually, sir has already mentioned the patients with PGI with ejection fraction, 50% yeah, yes, of them have sudden cardiac death. So a arrhythmia prevention is actually very important, uh, play important role in reducing the mortality in uh, both types of heart failure patients. Thank you, uh -huh. sir. Dr. Sarar Mubarak Choudhury, do you have any question? Dr. Sarar? Please unmute you. Uh, ask the question. Uh, this is my son's name. I am Dr. Nilufar Fatima, sir. Dr. Nilufar, I think so. Uh, okay. This is my son. Uh, yeah. Shara. Okay, Shara. I know. Yes, sir. I know. My son. I know. Uh, yeah. Hello, sir. Uh, sir, uh, this is a very nice and very uh, easy presentation for 
understand uh, the preserve rejection and heart failure with preserve rejection fraction. I have, uh, I have, uh, I have, I have a, a one question that is regarding the different entity of the uh, preserve rejection fraction. Is there any, uh, is, is, is there the same criteria of eco diagnosis for everyone or they have different um, um, criteria for different entity of uh, preserve rejection section, heart failure with preserve rejection section diagnosis. This is my question to Professor Nozir Sampar. Uh, basically, the parameters I have mentioned is for the general use, for general use, but uh, for different subset of patients, for example, the, if the patient has got, uh, uh, even the patient has got sarcoid, then psychoid patient also may have said the rejection fraction. So they have got their own criteria for that. And for aged people, diabetic, uh, diabetic patients and, uh, and, uh, and different ages. So for this, I refer you uh, to the guideline for the assessment of lead ventricular diastolic dysfunction in general, uh, and very recent guidelines uh, about how to diagnose uh, uh, lip, uh, heart failure with preserve rejection fraction, very recently published in 2019 by the ASC. So in those cases, I did them categorize. Since this is very general presentation, general lecture, so I made it very simple to understand, not to understand how to retain, the minimum thing, how to retain uh, for practical use. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Sir, sir may I ask a question, sir? Yeah, Arif. Sir, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I am Dr. Arif. So thank you, sir, for your excellent presentation, sir. It will be of great help for us. Sir, I have a question. How frequently in, encountered the primary heart failure with uh, preservation fraction? Mostly we get the secondary causes, but how frequently you encounter the primary cases which are heart failure with preserved rejection fraction? And is there any difference between the prognosis of these two groups? Uh, basically, I have shown you that uh, the, the if if you your mind uh, if you do not know it, you cannot search it. So yeah. first thing is you must search it. But our best main problem is we do not properly clinically search for the disease or we proper clinically uh, discuss the patient's, the patient's complaint. So prime preliminary important thing is the thorough clinical examination, clinical history taking and examination is very important. And then you have to find that, that this patient may have this and this. Then you go search for it. So number one, this is from our side. From the patient side, the patient is sometimes in the earlier they are not very symptomatic, but on they are symptom only in the uh, in case of exercise. So they do not come to uh, to the uh, uh, to the doctors or the healthcare system uh, for early diagnosis. But the patient who's come to our our our, uh, our clinic or, or our chamber uh, with other symptoms, if you search for it, then a significant number of patients you can have uh, you, you can have uh, these symptoms. I can give my own own experience. Many a time, my working in the private uh, as a uh, echocardiographer, so I examine many patients who do not have any cardiovascular complaint. Either they have got uh, come for uh, pre-surgery or pre-surgical checkup or other things, and in many cases, we see some parametric abnormality. I call parametric abnormality means the parameters of left ventricular dysfunction present without any symptom or the doctor, they have never asked for them. So we can see that they have got some sort of dysfunction, meaning they have got their, they have crossed the upper limit of normal of this particular parameter, which I've got already mentioned. So in that case, they have got a uh, diastolic dysfunction. They do not have the heart failure symptom, but they uh, develop out of, of it. Uh, there are a lot of patients uh, we, uh, we can see where they, they uh, come with a frank heart failure, even they have their lung is total have pulmonary edema, still then their ejection fraction is around 65, 68, 70 even. And most of the, in many patients with pregnancy, you can see even, though that time diagnosis is very difficult because high volume, uh, difficult, you can see. Uh, so there are a lot of patients, those who are having heart failure uh, with preserved ejection fraction, presenting with a frank, uh, frank heart failure symptom as you ask for it. 
So I do not give, I cannot give you the exact data because I don't have a study, but I can give my own experience. It will be those who come to the emergency room uh, or, in the, uh, or in the private chamber or the outpatient department, approximately 20 to 25% patient has got heart failure with ejection fraction uh, at the time of presentation, at the time of presentation. And sometimes uh, at the time of presentation, you see that the patient have got uh, uh, heart failure and possibly the ejection fraction is around 35. So we cannot say this is with ejection fraction. Once this volume load is, in, uh, is decreased, you see the patient ejection fraction go to 70%. So possibly, uh, possibly this patient has got a pretty long time of having heart failure with PGAP ejection fraction. And when his acuteness has come, and when the volume uh, in, uh, increases too much, too much, the patient presented as a position uh, with ejection fraction. So in summary, possibly we have uh, we have got a lot of patients with uh, PGAP ejection fraction. And uh, if you go retrospectively, when you, you diagnose the patient with heart failure, with a heart failure, if you follow the patient at least for five years, you see the mortality is not improving with the same drug you give to the heart failure with the ejection fraction. And there is a significant data, data from, from registry and also from the uh, RCTs, as I've shown you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Dr. Nawadesh, sir. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Thank you. Hello, sir. I, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers and particularly Professor Nishram sir for uh, this company. Uh, after a long time, I have attended a presentation of Professor Nishram. It is really brilliant. Uh, if, uh, a decade back, the heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction was a matter of minimum discussion, but nowadays uh, it is uh, uh, really in consideration for treatment of heart failure cases. Uh, beyond the clinical presentation of the patients, the investigations like ECO and uh, natriuretic factor uh, peptide is available mostly in. Uh, in most places of Bangladesh, and it is real consideration uh, to uh, see the uh, ejection fraction preserved in the patient of heart failure patients in our clinical practice. Again, I like to thank all, uh, and a nice time we have passed during this COVID time this evening. Thank you. This afternoon. Uh, thank Dr. Shabuddin, sir. Shabuddin, sir. Yes, thank you very much. Uh... Mohsin, uh, Dr. Abdul Adhuk Choudhury and the, uh, my mentor and my professor, Nojul Samsar. Sir is always uh, is a good uh, teacher and always a good uh, speaker also. I have no questions. I have, uh, uh, so I have learned this uh, a lot to this uh, presentation. There are very new things that sir have been introduced. Recently, in uh, uh, September, in October, that was in published in uh, European Society of Cardiology Journal, that has also included this also. I'm best, very much happy to see it, uh, that it still it is not incorporated into ESC guidelines and American College of Cardiology guidelines. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your nice presentation, sir. Uh, Thank you, sir. Dr. Ten, Dr. Ten, you unmute, please unmute him. Please unmute. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, sir, for your nice presentation. I have a question here. It's regarding the, uh, what is the advantage of the tissue dropper over the uh, conventional uh, echocardiogram considering heart failure? Uh, basically, a tissue doppler, you can uh, diagnose that there is some sort of uh, subtle systolic, uh, systolic dysfunction in this particular part of the, of the patient. Because uh, many times uh, we do not think that this patient develops systolic dysfunction. So when you compare with uh, tissue Doppler, and if we add with the speckle tracking uh, with GLS, then the uh, assessment would be more better than, uh, than simply 2D echo. So 2D echo principally 
diagnose or assess the systolic function and structural function. So for the functional aspect, we rely on the Doppler flow, tissue Doppler flow, and very recently for uh, strain staining, uh, strain, strain imaging. So, so if we just, just consider for a structural aspect and the functional aspect, the structural aspect uh, is by 2D. And if you go in advanced for CMR, et cetera, uh, and for the functional aspect, you go for uh, Doppler, tissue Doppler, and uh, if possible, available, go for uh, strain imaging. Thank sir, you, sir. can I add something? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, sir. Let's Thank consider sir. this. The heart failure is a failure in the proper utilization of the energy. At the tissue level, when this this uh, equilibrium with the energy and the need for work and the available energy because of the some systemic defect in the tissue occurs. We can detect those abnormalities very early on with tissue doppler. Yeah. But with 2D and uh, M mode, we can detect when it is at the much macro level. That's, the, uh, that's what Sal was saying. Very subtle abnormality we can detect with tissue doppler very early on, both systolic and diastolic. And at the macro level, when it's well manifested, we can detect by only 2D and M mode. Uh, actually, actually, for example, diastole, basically diastole was considered a passive phase, even in our, our student life and even our earlier. Yeah, yeah. But definitely so we, diastole is not a passive level. You have got active relaxation. So yeah. to understand left ventricular diastole dysfunction, which is giving rise to left ventricular heart failure degeneration fraction, basic understanding is of the relaxation physiology or diastole. Physiology of diastole is very yeah. important. And physiology of diastole, as you know, it starts from, as Professor Odud says, it starts from the cellular level. You have seen, I, actually, I didn't have much time so that we can, we can elaborate the cellular pathways and the other pathways. So that is very important to study that the cell, it starts from the cellular level, but it starts from the risk factors, goes to the cellular level first, and then to the uh, organ level. Uh, when the, the disease is spread to the organ level, possibly the symptom arises, and then they come to the uh, front of the doctors. Thank you. Sir, Dr. Uh, John, example, Dr. John. In, uh, can I add uh, something? Ah, of course, of course. For example, in ischemic cascade, there is uh, problems with the energy utilization, then the first thing that goes wrong is the diastolic function. That's right. And then gradually the systolic dysfunction, then the ECG changes, then symptoms. So I tell my students, always ask for a 14 tolerance. If the patient was saying, I used to climb up uh, three flights of stairs very easily, now I cannot do that. Even with normal ECG, normal apparent 2 d go, the patient must have diastolic yeah. dysfunction. Awesome. If we do the exercise and to do the uh, tissue doctor or anything, we can easily identify that. And that's a precursor of future heart failure with preserved heart injection failure. fraction. Dr. Kubirit Jawan is here, sir. Dr. Kubirit Jawan is the, is the, sir, please unmute him. Okay, sir. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, for your excellent presentation, sir is my guide. My thesis was first myocardial infarction. He tried his level best and he collected my thesis title. I was passive regarding acquiring my title of my thesis. And sir is always excellent in speaking. His speaking is rhythmic, it's very distinct. It's an Banglai Bulli, the Ishwan you active presentation. Thank you, sir, for your excellent presentation. Thank you. I want to add just a few moments because in our country, there are a lot of 2D ego. Many one are uh, busy with the 2D ego. So from 2D, we can actually gauge some sort of diastolic or If someone says that there is no reason almost in poverty, they have hypertrophy. Is that can give you some dictation or indication that this person have some may have some preserved position fracture with heart failure. So that's all. Things is all the systolic heart failure patient have diastolic dysfunction, but diastolic dysfunction is a totally different entity. That is all. 
So sir have elaborated all the things. It's an excellent presentation. I am very much impressed of speaking of my teacher. He's my mentor. Thank you, sir. Dr. Uh, Jalal sir, Jalal sir, Professor Jalaluddin sir, again, Professor M.D. Jalaluddin sir, do you hear me, sir? Sir, uh, unmute you, sir. Jalal sir, I have telephone to the telephone. I have to unmute you, sir. I have to unmute you, sir. Sir, Assalamualaikum, sir. Sir, hello, thank you, sir. Sir, I have to unmute you, sir. I have to unmute you, sir. hear me? I mean, I have a question to uh, Professor Nuzim Sir. The, is diastolic dysfunction is uh, obligatory for the diagnosis of half uh, Diastolic dysfunction is a, one of the important components for this, and this has been given as a diagnostic criteria of it. But only diastolic dysfunction is not equivalent to heart failure. This is a part of it. So sometimes uh, in uh, echocardiography, we can uh, search for diastole dysfunction, but we have not found diastole dysfunction. But patient in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So there, is, there are some cause of non half -tap, half -tap. So can you elaborate this? No, non half -tap, half -tap is, uh, uh, this is again is a misnomer because uh, Again, Mr. My health help is FF. So the non half is not a, uh, is a, is a not a correct terminology to be used. Uh, left ventricular dysfunction means it is normal function is response in many ways. Either is uh, either uh, dysfunction may be systolic or maybe diastolic. The diastolic dysfunction has got three components I have shown earlier. Either is stiffness, relaxation, another. So if the parameters for relaxation I have, I have shown in the in the chart. The parameters of relaxation is impaired. We call it diastolic dysfunction. Means that's a normal, normal level of function. But for heart failure, remember the signs and symptoms of heart failure must be there. On it is uh, signs of heart, uh, only diastolic dysfunction parameters are positive. Uh, there is no heart failure signs and symptoms. It is not heart failure. So if it is not heart failure, it is not a diastole, it is not dysfunction, dysfunction. So we see that the left ventricular diastolic dysfunction is one of the criteria, one of the parameters to diagnose. As shown in the, uh, in the chapter, how the diastolic dysfunction progresses to the heart failure, heart failure. Initially, many patients develop dysfunction part and then ultimately they develop heart failure. So you can say you can it is it is not very scientific, but you can say that left ventricular diastole dysfunction may be a precursor for left, uh, left heart failure with preserved injection fraction. Maybe uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Clinical sir. practice, sir. Uh, we have seen the patient have signs symptoms of heart failure. Mm -hmm. BNP is raised, raised yes. and we we uh, we search for two of one uh, two, uh, one of the two criteria. One is LVH plus LAE. Mm -hmm. or left or there is diastole dysfunction so if we do not found any features of diastole dysfunction so we cannot exclude the patient is suffering from half pep because we have lvh or left atrial enlargement we have raised bnp we have sign symptoms of heart failure so in that case we can uh, uh, diagnose this case of half pep is it right sir uh, actually basically this is a no man's land this picture it is right. neither go for reduced ejection fraction or for preserved ejection fraction. But if it had got preserved ejection fraction and other parameters of fine, you can classify as a uh, uh, no, no, no problem, as you say. Thank you, sir. Uh, Wadu, sir, if you comment, sir. Wadu, sir. Okay. Uh, Professor Abdul Rahman, sir. The thing, Ajoy, I want to put in something. Sometimes you don't get the. Uh, 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 can I put in something? Yes, yes. sir. Yes, sir. Uh, some 
sometimes we do not get the parameters of diastole dysfunction, but if we do the patient exercise and the check it, we'll get that. Yes. Because diastole yes. dysfunction depends on the heart rate as well. And if we do that, we can find out whether the patient actually have that. That's why analysis, ASR was repeatedly stressing. History taking is so important in uh, deciding whether that patient may have diastole dysfunction or not. Uh, in the in the stage of diagnosis, I have shown you that the last stage, the fourth stage, I have shown that oh, there see. are certain cases can be uh, can be uh, diagnosed. In that case, you, two, you can do two things. One is right heart catheterization for uh, real finding of the pressure and yeah. cardiopulmonary testing. So, so uh, I have shown two uh, yeah. slides also. The before exercise and after exercise, how the left atrial pressure goes right, uh, high. Thank you. That's how was repeatedly stressing. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. Professor Abdul, sir, Abdul, do you hear me? Yes. Do you hear me? Abdul, I want, sir, to, I want to two, two comments from you, sir. Number one, uh, so nice, elaborate, I think, uh, laborious presentation. I think, sir, uh, presentation for, for seven days, uh, for so elaborate presentation. Few comments for the presentation, number one. Uh, issue your presentation, Jita Bolle and Amadeko Viri John, sir. Uh, number two, sir. Uh, you are the great organizer I ever seen in Bangladesh. Uh, we mourn, you know, our 38 fellow seniors, colleagues, and junior has lost during this pandemic era. Regarding this issue, our NICV is the hottest spot now. What is your recommendation to uh, save saving the front fighters? Sir? Thank you, sir. Two comments from sir. Thank you very much. Actually, regarding the presentation of Professor Nazrul Islam, sir. Nothing to comment on everybody. It is outstanding presentation. Outstanding. Outstanding. I will say that it's outstanding presentation. I will say very simple word, outstanding presentation. Number two is that uh, I have no one thing uh, how diastole dysfunction causes the sudden cardiac death. Because systolic dysfunction causes cardiac cardiac death. We know it. They are endogenic. And that can be prevented by uh, pacemaker implantation, DC, diffusion implantation, but sudden cardiac death, uh, how diastole dysfunction can cause a sudden cardiac death, how it could be prevented? This is uh, one question. Sir. And last comment, Amit 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 Jabo, sorry, 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 Actually, uh, basically, uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction uh, has got many, many factors to develop uh, arrhythmogenic. Uh, one is the left ventricle hypertrophy. As you know, the hypertrophic heart is more arrhythmogenic than the normal heart or, or even uh, infarcted heart to some, some extent. Number one. Number two, we do, we do not know the real pathophysiology. So we have got plenty of heterogeneity or phenotypic system. So it starts from simple hypertrophy from hypertension to amyloid to pericardial disease to myocardial disease and other disease. So so there are a lot of other things. That's why you see the there are these myocardia become more arrhythmogenic in many times. Number one. Number two, since we do not know the exact pharmacological function over this particular group of patients, sometimes we use theoretically or empirically many, many, many of the things. And the more, more, many of the drugs can also develop arrhythmogenic. So you see that uh, the if you see the two type of data, one from RCTs, different uh, uh, RCTs, and another from different uh, registries, there are two different data. One group of data says that cardiovascular death is more in heart rate than another data shows the cardiovascular is less in, uh, in heart rate in patient. But arrhythmia as a whole, arrhythmia as a whole, the, uh, the basic, basic uh, pathophysiology should be understood. Uh, understood. Past the detection of arrhythmia and the type of arrhythmia. Which type of arrhythmia uh, needs which type of investigations we must uh, think. So basically, diagnosis first and then go for the uh, for the etiology of arrhythmia. And according to the etiology of arrhythmia, that can be treated either pharmacologically or if needed by electrophysiological. Uh, this, is, uh, this is important. Act, number one. Number two is. Uh, most of the cardiovascular death in HFF is also an, also arrhythmogenic, and they develop heart failure go to uh, cardiac failure. Heart failure uh, heart failure death is more in uh, uh, systolic heart failure, 
uh, or the, with a reduced injection fraction, but if it less in uh, heart failure with bigger injection fraction. Thank you, sir. May, may I something, sir? sir? A, a RHP a analysis shows. RHP analysis shows the patient with less injection fraction, less than thirty percent, they have more death due to the progression of the heart failure itself. Mm, but yes. those in the uh, around thirty-five to forty-five or around those, they have more death related to arrhythmia. It seems that the presence of both uh, a, a dead a tissue or disease tissue and presence of viable tissue which are jeopardized. This juxtaposition probably uh, led to more arrhythmogenicity in this group. Yeah. Abja. Uh, Abja Tarman, do you think that we should go for uh, defibrillation implantation? DC oh, implantation? Do you think that it is Atar is not there, no? Uh, yeah. Atar is not there. Atar? Atar, sir, chillen. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So we will go for the next. Uh, Tomorrow's query is uh, actually. Actually, but the studies have not shown any benefit of uh, plantation in those with. Uh, Okay, now thank you so much. Uh, Motion, Shonajai. Shonajai, Infection control at the Shomashadra is actually centrally to government tri court system. Among government can to Akon, Dakaza Cheje, Mane, Puro country, lockdown, Nakore, Shed a red zone, green zone of Hakur, Sabino, John Urushare, Sherakumi protect the hospital and administration. In the Busta Habe, the Tar Hospital, key capacity, Tar Hospital infection rate to come on. It is centrally correspond Kore, Kinto at a Kortobe. Nakole Kinto, problem Holoki, Amra Nizari Shop Kisikurta Chai. Akon, we have to help the infectious people. We have to take opinion from the Holoki, ISO expert. We have to medicine expert. Akon Amra Kadlus, Amra Shop Kisikurta Chachi, Etakin Tikna, Amar Munaze, Amar Munaze Hospital, Jekas, Tara Nizara Bushbe, Bushe. Unknown expert the administration shut the washers between NICB the administration and Bosch is second, but NICB is one thirty three Shulam among many of the silent case, maybe Shudrang at a kind of panic at the sixty who says doctor, the general Jung Amasajara Kaskoto, Tarama telephone corre, Sardachi, Amazon Duakuren, Amahado, Bashakovi near Firbu. Kaji Edon a panic jagger ticket into Amadaka Bera Stobe, among Shabaki confident in Kotaman. You have to be discussed with the by yourself. With the um, authority and also the infectious control peoples. Karon Ekane Mun has a problem to holo ki je Amra Kindu Janina the COVID infection ki have a control kota. This lama personal Janina. But Amadha J PP Gula Parahoche, but ask a shokalam to PP Pore Baregesi, the take ham take ham to Ostriochi. Tarkan PP Pore Amadha J weather, weather to Africa the Bishikon Takato are very difficult. আর এই যে আমরা তো পিপিএ পড়ছি তখন নাক যখন ঘামতেছে আমার যখন মুখ দিয়ে ঘাম ছেছে সেটা কত রকম প্রোডাকশন দিচ্ছে সেটাও কিন্তু একটা ভাববার বিষয় আমার কাছে যেটা মনে হইছে আমার নিজের কাছে ভয় হচ্ছিল ওয়েটি হয়ে গেছে পুরো আমার হলো কি মাস্ক এবং সব কিছু ওয়েটি হয়ে গেছে সুতরাং দিস অল থিংস উই হ্যাভ টু ডিসকাস আমার মনে হয় আর এখন गवर्नमेंट যেহেতু বেশি রেড হলো তো ব্লক বন্ধ করে দিচ্ছে আমার মনে হয় गवर्नमेंट মনে হয় স্যার আমি কমেন্ট করতে চাই স্যার আমার মনে হয় যে এই যে 8 ঘন্টা 12 ঘন্টা 24 ঘন্টা ডিউটি করছে it is not sir. Four hours, four hundred duty for a day. J. Sister must act on a shot in duty coach. Seven days, Covid Ashwadali. It is a good scientific. It is not going to be under child contact to body. PP for a max for a among PP for the user, Batumi Javana, Namas for a Javana, Ushomo Utapuri Taktavisa. She can be possible at least seven days, twenty four hours in hospital. It is a good scientific site to think the vicious. এটা তো এখন পলিসি বা হসপিটাল অ্যাডমিশন যেটা মনে করে সেটাই করছে তবে ডিফিকাল্ট বিষয়টা ডিফিকাল্ট সাত এই মানে সাত দিন ধরে ডিউটি করা 24 ঘন্টা পড়ে থাকাটা কিন্তু ডিফিকাল্ট আমার কাছে যেটা মনে হয় আমি শর্টার টাইম হলে আমি একটু অ্যাড করতে চাই মোসিনের সাথে জি স্যার তো N95 মাস্ক পরে আমি কাজ করতে গিয়ে দেখেছি সব সময় শ্বাস নেওয়াটা সমস্যা হয় এবং 3-4 ঘন্টা পরে খুব এক্সহাউস্টেড লাগে সেই ক্ষেত্রে আপনি যে প্রস্তাবটা করেছেন যে ডেইলি 3 থেকে 4 ঘন্টা করে ডিউটি এবং এটা ইন্টারভেন দাও এটা অনেক সাইন্টিফিক এটা অনেক সাইন্টিফিক এটা আসলে 12 ঘন্টা একটা না ডিউটি করে পিপি করে আমাদের এই ওয়েদারে ইট ইজ ভেরি ডিফিকাল্ট ভেরি ডিফিকাল্ট একটা 
There is some documentation. The PPA basically can put it. Body oxygen saturation fall. Kore. There is a documentation. PPA basically can put it. Thakle oxygen saturation body fall. Kore. Even shade on the business. Mask. 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 Basically can put it. Thakle. But oxygen saturation fall. Kore. So that this issue will be taken care of. Even COVID there. Myth. But that brain injury. But as per the paper, the claim. So that mainly hypoxia. যেটা হাইপোক্সিয়ার জন্য নয় কিন্তু মেইন ডেথ গুলো হচ্ছে এবং হাইপোক্সিয়ার জন্য অর্গান গুলো বেশি ইনজুরি হচ্ছে দিস ইজ হাইপোক্সিয়া অনেক সময় থ্রম্বোটিক বলা হচ্ছে কিন্তু মোস্ট অফ দেম আর হাইপোক্সিয়া হাইপোক্সিয়ার জন্য কাজেই এখন আমরা যদি পিপিএ পড়তে গিয়ে আমরা মাস্ক পড়তে গিয়ে যদি হাইপোক্সিয়া বানাই তাহলে তো ডিফিকাল্ট আর ওইরকম সোয়েটিং হইলে রিয়েলি ডিফিকাল্ট যে প্রশ্ন আসছে যে শর্ট আর ডিউরেশনে ডিউটি করা যায় কিনা এটা তো ম্যানেজমেন্ট ডিসিশন নেবে প্রত্যেকটা হসপিটালের ম্যানেজমেন্ট ডিসিশন নিতে হবে এনআইসিবি নিজে বসে ডিসিশন নিতে হবে বঙ্গবন্ধু নিজে ডিসিশন নিতে হবে প্রাইভেট সেক্টর নিজে ডিসিশন নিতে হবে এটা गवर्नमेंट তো এইভাবে তো ডিসিশন ইনপোজ ওইভাবে তো করবে না गवर्नमेंट বা गवर्नमेंट এর সাথে কথা বলে করা যেতে পারে गवर्नमेंट কে বলা যেতে পারে আমার এই স্টাফ আছে আমরা এই কাজ করতে যাচ্ছি উই ক্যান সেন্ড এ মেসেজ ডাউন করা যায় তাতে কারো আপত্তি থাকার কথা না বাট ইউ हैव टू মেইনটেইন দা ডিউটি আর پیشنট এর সংখ্যাও তো কম এখন হলো কি নাম্বার অফ দা ডিউটি ডক্টর তো কম ইজিলি কমানো যায় নাম্বার অফ দা ডিউটি ডক্টর ইজিলি কমানো যায় একটু সবাই আমরা একটু লাস্ট দুইটা क्वेश्चन নিয়ে নি थैंक यू थैंक यू सर सर थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू सर लास्ट कुछ टू क्वेश्चन वन फ्रॉम द मोहम्मद फजान कोविड ही इज फ्रॉम मलेशिया ही इज एसिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर ऑफ क्विंग यूनिवर्सिटी मलेशिया सजन कोविड प्लीज वन क्वेश्चन फॉर द पैनलिस्ट स्टिल आई हैव नो क्वेश्चन सर थैंक यू वेरी मच सर फॉर अ टू कमेंट समथिंग ओवर अ लेजेंडरी प्रोफेसर लाइक प्रोफ नजरुल इस्लाम So thank you very much for your nice presentation. I just want to add one thing that uh, in in the slides, Sar showed that that once the heart failure develop, that patient survival rate five years or things. And here you see, still in our practice, even in in an ICBD uh, Dhaka Medical College BSM, that uh, when we follow up any patient with heart failure, we use the category of NYHA classification. We don't use the that stage a stage b stage c c d i think uh, if we can we can start the practice of using that uh, a c c classification stage and if we can write the patient with hypertension if we can write down in his prescription that you are in stage a heart failure i think patient will be uh, more careful because once uh, he is uh, in stage c and um, chance of his survival and morbidity and mortality is compared that means prevention here in heart failure prevention is the should be the key factor uh, for treatment of the heart failure it should be more, more proactive this is my comment and wadu sir kichu bolben sir ki comments actually nyh actually means functional status not the heart failure classification the functional status is nyh 2 3 or 4 and yes I agree with Shah Jahan. Je, because we, if we consider that we state in the prescription, the patient is in heart failure stage B or stage C, that will put uh, more attention to this fact. And both the future physician who is attending the uh, patient and the patient and their family themselves will be much more aware of the fact that they are uh, in danger. I think he, he has got a point, very good point. थेरापी either pharmacological non pharmacological or device therapy follow up nih is definitely important so in all the textbooks and everywhere this staging and nih classification as given on the same page or in the same yeah. figure both are important thank you thank you both sir dr bhavani logan dr bhavani uh yes yes doctor this last question okay yeah okay i have one last question my question is between uh, arn inhibitor and ac inhibitor or arb which one is better okay what is that uh actually uh, the heart failure studies 
uh, reach a milestone with the ad, uh, advancement of the ACE inhibitor. Previously, a stage four heart failure has a death rate of uh, uh, 90%. One year survival was 10%. And after mm -hmm. that advancement of ACE inhibitor, the death rate starts lowering. Among the ARP, always you will get in all the books, ARPs should be used when the patient have side effect or could not be used due to other reasons. Then the ARP is chosen. And among the ARPs, uh, Pulsartan and uh, Candesartan, these two have uh, RCT proven effect in reducing the mortality of heart failure. And ARNI is the next step that has come around to reduce and the heart failure death rate in case of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. The results so far in case of heart failure pizza ejection fraction is mixed and not clear. Some studies are still going on. I don't know when will the results will be available considering the COVID situation. Then we can have some ideas. Sir, uh, do you want to have some comments? No, Sorry. actually, uh, that, that what heart he has has said is uh, is perfect. Uh, Udhav said is perfect. Actually, there is no actually between uh, difference between IRB. But a, since AC inhibitor came in the field, this has improved a lot to the uh, in the side of uh, reduction fraction. And I have shown in our picture the last three or four decades, the improvement uh, of preserved reduction fraction has not that much marked. Maybe slightly yes. improved, but not that much marked in preserved ejection fraction. Thank you, sir. We already left two hours, sir. Thank you, sir, <laughs> with us. Professor Wadu, sir, please uh, conclude our session. Uh, my comment should be uh, with two lines. To be kya mon kore gaan koro he guni, ami awak kwe shuni, ami awak kwe shuni. Now, this sir has always been a fantastic teacher, an extraordinary presenter, and a really a fountain of in-depth knowledge. And all this has been manifested into this presentation. As Professor Abdul Salam was saying, this is outstanding, extraordinary, astonishing, splendid. I, I am just out of all the adjectives that I can use. I am really submerged in a sense of happiness among this uh, period of despair. After uh, going through this lecture, this is the experience is actually actually a, a, like a breeze of hope. So thank you, sir, thank you. for giving us some hope and giving us uh, the hope that we should learn more, we should achieve more, and we should not despair despite the uh, such a cruel uh, environment of COVID. Thank you, Mosin. Thank, thank you, sir. sir. Uh, Thank you, oh, sir. Okay, we are sir. continuing our class with a little bit short because uh, this is the situation to continue class. Uh, we are our, okay. we lost our colleagues. Lots of colleagues are in the hospital admitted, but we should go for go continue our normal activities. So Thank thanks, you. participants. Around Thank 200 you, participants. Around 200 participants in our class. And thank you, panelists. Professor Abzal sir, Shahbuddin sir, Khandro Kamrul Islam, Nirajesh Farid sir, Professor Jalaluddin sir, also here. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Inceptor thank Pharmaceuticals. They are given that job last one month. Some of their uh, their uh, colleagues also COVID positive. Pray for them. Also, thanks Dr. Arifur Wan Shajol. And as you are Professor Abdul Adit Chaudhary. Our next class will tomorrow. Professor H.L. Uturavan, sir, on aortic stenosis. Until then, yes. goodbye. Allah Hafiz. Stay safe. Take care. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.